We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrevix. Joining me today is Jaime Carrasco, Portfolio Manager at Canaccord Genuity. How are you today, Jaime? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back in uh, in these uh, in these times, which it's always, are very interesting. Absolutely, it is. It is very interesting, and it's always good to have you back and kind of uh, you know be able to look back on our on our previous interviews. And we have the uh, the the fortune of having you on video this time, so that's uh, it's good to put a face to the name. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I guess we've been talking for quite a while now. If I recall, first interview was. I don't know, a number of years ago now, and a lot of the things that we've been talking about are playing out finally. Absolutely. So I and find that very interesting. Yeah. It's it's very interesting to me to always think about this stuff over over different timelines, and, and we're going to dive into a little bit of that here, but um, you wanted to start with uh, a particular thank you you wanted to make. Yeah, I wanted to thank Canaccord and the management of the firm I'm at because it's so nice to be at an independent firm where my opinions are allowed to be said. You know, one of the issues I had at, at my previous employer, one of the big banks, was that they were restricting what I was saying with regards to manipulation of gold and everything else that was coming down the pipeline. And here we are, right? Um, the the A lot of the things that I foresaw coming are, are here. The talk of the reset, the monetary reset, what's going on with blockchain and how important that is. Well, a lot of places would not allow you to speak your mind. And that's one of the things that I appreciate the most about the firm I'm at, that they allow independent thinking to take place and allow us to relay those strategies to clients. And they're definitely playing out, as can be seen from my special opportunities portfolio, which I sent you the returns for. And that, to a big extent, is the ability to allow a speculative portfolio or a hedge portfolio to be properly positioned. So I do have to thank uh, Canaccord for that. Yeah, and I think that's something that, um, you know, in, even in a broader context is is getting more and more valuable is is the ability of us to share our, our thoughts without being censored, right? Well, ex- exactly, because we are living in a bit of a dystopian um, uh, environment where, where thoughts are being restricted and people want us to think one way or another. For, as for me, that doesn't work because I tend to think out of the box. I have to advise clients with what I see coming and what I see coming is a massive shift, right? And um, I think that's a good segue to talk about um, what's good about about the future that I see, whereby, you know, a lot of people are finally jumping on. There's a lot of talk about Bitcoin, a lot of talk about blockchain, a lot of talk about gold, a lot of talk about silver, what's going on with the silver market, I find extremely important. But nobody's put it together into one one streamlined strategy the way I have, because I think it works, right? So so back to the two portfolios I manage. One is the the special opportunities portfolio, which is just a standalone portfolio with 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 precious metals and blockchain. The other one is the equity income portfolio, which is the the one for my my parents type of of investor that required to generate cash flow, but that embedded in it has the the special opportunities portfolio for 30% of it. The special opportunities portfolio was set up as a standalone solution for big family offices when I was covering them in Chile. Now that portfolio has always had, um, you know, that that tagline that you that that you're responsible for hedge accord- accordingly. I always add gold, silver, and blockchain. Why is that important? Well. As I showed you, uh, that portfolio is tracking right now um, a 12 months performance of about 200%. And that is 100% uh, the, the benefit of having had blockchain at the right time. Now, within that, though, the asset allocation component is what makes it, which is very important because the growth of blockchain has allowed us to continually rebalance the portfolio back to precious metals. Now, when I say precious metals, that portfolio is composed 100% of producers because I want the leverage. Now, let's talk about the composition of, of how I played the blockchain within that portfolio. Well, I originally took a position in blockchain back in 2017 before I left Scotiabank um, into a company called Hive. Now, that position originally was just 2% of the portfolio when it was almost IPO, knowing full well that 
blockchain and Bitcoin were heading for that blow off top, similar to the dot coms back in 2000. Well, I went in on a two and a half percent position and then I just let it crash because I knew that it was going to cleanse. Right. And I allowed Bitcoin to get to 3000 and the blockchain to get to a ridiculous amount. Well, that company really got to nine cents. At that point, it became, it went from being 2% of the portfolio to being nothing in the portfolio. And I said to clients, well, this company's going to make it. They're going to make, actually, it wasn't just Hive. There were two of them. The other one was uh, Ethereum Capital, which was the company that Omers had set up for um, for the blockchain, uh, Omers being one of the Canada's biggest pension funds. So that I was interested in the fact that they were getting into the sector. Anyways, so we allowed it to to pretty well go down to to almost nothing, but through that process, I kept interviewing the company. I kept talking to them. I, I had a, a developed a really good rapport with Frank Holmes now. And I realized that this company was going to make it. The earnings were there. There was a lot of transition. So then I advised clients that we raised the position up to 10% of the portfolio. And then we've just let it build. So, so it was one thing was the timing that it was perfect. It was at the bottom of that cycle. But then we allowed it to build within it. And every time it, I allowed it to get back up to 20% of the portfolio. And then every time it got up to 30, I would trim it back, trim it back, trim it back. As a result, we were able to add precious metals throughout last year four times. Now we're still back at 20%. We had two more companies within that, within the blockchain component. But what's beautiful is the fact that in a, in, in a million dollar portfolio now, I'm sitting on 200,000 worth touch based on blockchain in a second but by the same token we're sitting on 900 on almost eight hundred thousand dollars worth of producers that when you really think about the producers and i'm talking about good quality producers the ones that i've always managed low cost producers would would cost of production around seven to eight hundred dollars canadian or silver producers would cost of production around nine to ten dollars well what is important about that is that Gold is going to go because gold is being it's being manipulated. Back to an article I just saw in Bloomberg where where Bitcoin's replacing gold. You know that is complete BS, and it's 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 a narrative that's being presented so that people don't go to it. They're spending billions and billions of dollars manipulating the price down, so it's definitely important to them. So forget what they're telling you and act and figure out what they're doing. So what do I own? I own producers with leverage to $3,000 gold or higher of greater actual leverage to the earnings bigger than the movement I had in blockchain last year. So, so it's that's the component that I want is that lifeboat, the leverage to earnings. So when, I, when you look at $3,000 gold within some of those producers, you got to think about the value of the reserves on the ground and the dividends that they're going to be playing, that's not even added to the fact that their leverage to the earnings is going to be so, it's going to be much bigger. And that's why what's good about blockchain is that it's allowed us to see where we're going with the precious metals because the precious metals, you know, central banks aren't selling, they're holding on to them. So the way that I see that portfolio is this. Blockchain to me is already building a decentralized future, which I think it's great. So the way that I see blockchain and I see the companies, the, the miners of the, the ones that are producing is very similar to the Roman roads. And I'm going to use a little bit of history. You know that I love history. So think about the Roman roads. The Roman roads were built on top of dirt roads, but they used cobblestones. That's what really opened up the empire. Well, the way I see blockchain is a brand new road being built on top of the internet, this data highway of just data. Well, all of a sudden we're building this new road using coins, right? So to confuse Bitcoin with the blockchain is silly because it's just one coin within that road. Now, what's important is, is that that road is going to cover the internet and we're only a thousand miles out of Rome. So I'm quite happy to ride that wave and let it build. On the other side, manage the precious metals because the precious metals is about the destruction of the past. What we have here is a massive mass of over indebted governments that will never pay these debts back. Well, throughout history for 4,000 years, a reset, which they keep talking about, the special drawing rights, go back to James Rickard's books. Well, it's already, they're already talking about the reset. That reset will occur around gold and silver as it always has because gold is money. So think about Bitcoin as a currency for a second. Bitcoin will eventually be all mine. So think about the internet circa 1995 once, once the first company was done. Well, as it continues to build, why can't somebody else come out with a Bitcoin number two, Bitcoin 2.0 as a separate closed 
decentralized unit. That's why, to me, Bitcoin is no different than the U.S. dollar or the ruble or anything, but it's an electronic currency. The only ultimate form of money supply is the gold that's shared within central banks, and that's the difference. So back to how I see it, blockchain is already building the future, gold and silver about the destruction of the past, and that's really where, where the, the, the two benefits are. I think the destruction of the of the past monetary system and the rebuilding of the new one is the real opportunity for investors because you want to be in the lifeboats as the financial Titanic sinks, right? If you're in it, you're not going to survive. That's a great way to put it, Jaime. And I'd like to go back a little bit to that article that you were talking about, uh, Bitcoin displacing gold as an inflation hedge. Obviously, we've seen gold not perform nearly as well uh, let's say over the past year as Bitcoin has, but taking into account, you know, a, a longer term timeline, I think is important. Um, how do you, how do you view that as gold, let's say as an inflation hedge and, and really taking into account the timeline over which you look at it? Okay. I started buying back into my gold positions back in 2015. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in very, at very low prices, but along the way, I always said when it comes to gold, Buy right, sit tight, because patience will be key to wait it out and let the let everything unravel. So when it comes to gold, I think, and the precious metals, I think that that the mantra has always been that the longer it takes, the bigger the fiscal mess, the higher the price will have to go. And that's why patience is key in order to build your positions. What's been great, though, is the fact that the prices be, are being manipulated. I know that. My clients know that. I've explained it along the way. And they're happily sitting on these positions because thanks to blockchain, we've seen the appreciation already start to occur. So it's nice to be in, in the hindsight of time. It's great because, you know, what I see is people jumped in. So look at what's happening with the, with the precious metals right now. We had that run up last summer when we went from 1500 up to 1900. Everybody jumped in at that point and now they've all come out. Well, I jumped in at 1500 or 1100 back in 2015 and I've been building my positions. So right now I'm in a position of strength. So what's been great is as these markets have pulled back, I've been able to add more and more companies that I really like within within the, the portfolio. By the way, in that portfolio, I have all of the producers, the explorers, which to me are a different animal because those are about speculation and real estate. Those I have outside of the portfolio, right? And that's a different game that I'm playing where I'm, I'm trying to capture warrants. I'm trying to capture as much exposure from for clients, but also be able to sell if I have warrants to, 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 to move out. But back to your question, I think it's important to understand that if central banks aren't selling, they're buying, there's a reason for it. And, and when you start to understand history and the history of money and, and, and electronic currency, then you start to disassociate the components of how to structure a portfolio. Because if you really look at it, the, 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 um, the consequences of all of this money printing are hitting us, even though they're lying about the numbers. Anybody that thinks that inflation's at 1.2%, well, I'm telling you, you're in big trouble with your money because you don't understand that everything else is going up in price. The, 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 the devaluation of the purchasing power of money is happening around the world of currency. It's happening globally, especially look at Canada. We have no gold. 40% of debt is being purchased by the, by the central bank in Canada. That can't continue. People have less than $200 in savings. Now we have the whole COVID mess, which is slowing down the economy even more. But even before that, the, what are the consequences always? Greater inequality of, of, of social inequality, the destruction of the middle class, the loss of savings, and those that do have savings, they don't realize that the purchasing power of those savings are going, going down very, very fast. So as a result, I think the best way to do it is to have that patience and the fortitude to understand what you're doing and continue to build positions, which is what, I, what I've been doing for clients. And again, Buy right, sit tight, and wait. Patiently wait, and you will be rewarded. I find the the idea, Jaime, of your rebalancing the portfolio. You know, as as let's say these positions, like you said, in in Hive, um, appreciate, and then you trim back and put into something you see as as less um, less. Uh, inflated at the time. I I think that's a great way to kind of look at how to really um, distribute your your um, capital appropriately. So 
how do you see, let's say, the current Bitcoin cycle? I know there's a, a chart that has been going around recently around every halvening of Bitcoin. So do you think that we're closer to the end of that cycle where it's going to come back down or uh, let's say closer to the middle where it's it's still appreciating? Um, you know what? I think that's the wrong question. You're asking me, where's the internet going around 1995? I'm going to tell you it's going to continue growing, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think it all has to be measured in relation to all the money that's floating around. We're talking about trillions, 200. We're talking quadrillion of quadrillion amounts of money floating mm -hmm. all over the place. The, the, the blockchain just got to $2 trillion. Well, I think it's going to grow a lot higher because, again, the road's going to cover the whole world. So that is a different animal. I think what's more important is is not concentrate on the the minutia of the day-to-day -day changes, but look at the big picture as to where we're going and, and, and how it's developing, right? And I think that's amazing because when I look at a decentralized world, I think that blockchain has this, has the, the, the real solution to gold's problem. And the gold, gold's problem is the banking system. If we have an electronic system to ledger our money and shift it all over the place that really doesn't require the banking system, why would we not use it? Why would I pay fees to a bunch of guys that keep lying to me so that I can uh, be not in control of my own money, right? When I have an electronic system, it's kind of like email versus the post office. Well, I think everything's going to change. And what, I, what I'm looking at is, is more importantly, not to worry about the negativity of everything around us because yes, a ship will sink. Right. So, again, if we look at history, I think the analogies that we have to use today isn't even the 1930s when the power shifts from the pound to the dollar. I think we have to go back to 1770. That's the, 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 the currency reserve shift that we're, that we're, we're going to see, because if you go back to that period and we were talking about what's going to happen after that. And I, and I was to tell you, you know what? After this is over, you're going to have a vote. You're going to be able to decide. You would have said, well, what are you crazy? You're, but my king will never allow that. I'm like, the king won't be there. The, the, the system as we know it is going to change. That's the problem is that we're trying to figure out how to solve the Titanic, knowing not, not fully understanding that the Titanic might be gone and we're going to have to rebuild it. Well, how do we rebuild it? Well, I think that when we finally rebuild it and people wake up to what happened in Latin America, Germany in the 30s or the Soviet republics, pensions were gone. Everything, everything that every, everybody expected had to be rebuilt. Well, in that environment, you have a clean slate and you can do it better. There's a lot of social pain, mind you, and that's what I'm protecting clients from, how to best protect from the loss of purchasing power and, and, and take over the purchasing power that's coming our way but had a position, right? And in that environment, I think, I think it's going to be great because of what, what I see happening. Look at, look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin on its own will continue to develop. Even if they ban it, it doesn't matter because it'd be like the US dollars in Latin America. Every, my uncles were you know, doing anything to get their, their hands on US, US dollars in the black market. Black markets occur because people don't, not everybody will fully listen to their governments, right? There's always that 10% of the population to, to 10 to 20% uh, that, that won't conform and they're going to say, you know what, I'm going to do something, I'm going to look after my family on my own. And so because of that, when I look at, look at, look at Bitcoin, what, we have uh, 21 million units of the 27 million already, already mined? Well, you can't stop it anymore, right? There's going to be 21 million people, wealthy people around the world are going to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to put one away. So it would probably become like a Picasso. But the important thing is that people are starting to transact with them. And it's not just a transaction, it's also the ledgering component of the blockchain that is important and it's going to change the way we, 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 we do things, right? So, so how do you play it? I think you have to have a clear understanding of where we're going and, and how it all plays out. Also knowing that there's a lot of uncertainty. Because, you know, I can tell you the positives of it. Well, in Chile, as we went through that, uh, people that lived in the countryside did much better. I think people, because of COVID, people are figuring that out. Communal living came back. People, family values. Look at the family values today. today. Everybody's selfish. Nobody really cares about, about, about the neighbor. Well, when, when that change occurs, people start to become much more aware of their, of their, of their circumstance and they become, they, they start to change. Social structure will change after. So don't worry about it yet. I think that comes later. I think for now, what you have to do is individually think for yourself as to, okay, how do I shelter my family from what's coming? 
and how to best do it. I use history and I've always been planning for it using what history taught me in terms of where we're heading and also part of my life, what happened in Latin America and those examples. And I think it's the way to go. And, you know, I can tell you that a lot of clients now that they're, they, they, they've seen the, the results, they're much happier and they understand where, we're, where I'm taking them. So they're, they're sleeping better. And so am I. So in that vein, Jaime, as, as you're using, um, let's say, history as a, as a template for what's coming, do you see hyperinflation or, or major inflation as inevitable in this case? I think it's inevitable because don't forget that hyperinflation occurs when people's spending patterns change. To a big extent, hyperinflation is a social effect because pe- the worst of people comes to be and they start changing their, their social attitudes. Let me explain it to you differently. You're sitting in a cinema watching a movie and all of a sudden you start to smell um, smoke. How many people have to get up before everybody runs out? When everybody runs out, that's hyperinflation. That's too late. Right. I'm one of the ones, the first ones that's going to say, OK, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go wait by the door. I'm going to leave. Then there's that 10 percent that 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 creates change. The rest, well, they they're the ones that are always on left on the boat. Right. So because of that, and I think we're already there, I think the silver squeeze movement is definitely signaling that. I think Bitcoin's definitely signaling that. You know, why is Bitcoin at 60,000? Because there are people that are smelling smoke and they're buying it. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm anxious to hear the debate between uh, Michael Sayer and, uh, and uh, oh, Fiera Frank, Capital and Frank, Frank Justra, right? Because again, they're, they're arguing both sides of the same coin, in my opinion. I, I think that, that, that um, th- both are components of, of each other, right? But what we have here is two, two people arguing inside the cinema, oh, I think I smell smoke. What's the best solution, right? My, my solution is take both and run out. Yeah. So recently you also posted about Yellen uh, floating balloons of a global tax rate. So what is she trying to accomplish with this? And, and what do you think the downstream effects of this are going to be? Well, um, I think the downstream effect is more the consequence of something that I spoke already doing. Uh, I was interviewed right before the last election in the U.S. And I said, look, if, if Trump wins, if Biden wins, we're going to end up with a global system, a global government, which is really what the IMF wants, you know, uh, Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, well, he's going to do whatever they tell him to do, and he's quite happy to launch a, a global tax. My concern is that what we're heading in, is into a global structure where our sovereignty is not going to be decided by our elected officials here. It's going to be decided by some government out of Davos, which has been dictating to us for a long time. I have a problem with that because I do believe in the political system. I do believe in the social contract, and I think we're walking away from that. What Yellen's saying right now to me is noise, because again, we will have to see what kind of society we built after the destruction occurs. I think one of the problems that they face is that because of Trump, they're four years too late. So what I'm what I'm thinking is that what on what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does the does the global system unravel faster than they can implement change? Or that's the change that whatever change they implement come before that. I personally look at what's going on. As we speak, I'm watching the dollar break just touching 92. Well, um, it had that big breakdown at 92.50. Then it ran up last week for a little bit above 93. And now it looks ready to break. In my opinion, this is why they're talking about reset, because they know they have to kill the dollar. They know they have to kill the currency reserve. And the number is telling me that, and by the way, they're spending massive amount of money trying to keep the price of gold and silver from rising. The manipulation's ongoing. Three o'clock in the morning, it's noticeable. Everybody's talking about it. Well, w- you know, this whole thing, oh, the dollar's strong, the dollar's strong. That's complete propaganda, in my opinion, because at 92, it isn't strong. It's ready to fall apart. So if it falls apart, how come gold is not going higher? Well, I think that to me is the big the big picture is what's going to happen to the dollar and the dollar's ready to go and they have to implode it, right? So again, well, that's the implosion. Well, go ahead. When when you say they, who do you mean? Well, the, they're, they're the central signaling. banks. Okay. The so. central banks, the bullion banks, the ones that are benefiting from the money that's being printed the most. Like, are you or I getting any of these? Uh, how many trillions have they printed since 20 since covid hit and never mind since 2008 i haven't received any have you I nobody is nope. right like the, the, the tragedy of covid-19 tom is this we don't have the money 
to give everybody medical care, even though we've spent trillions of dollars backing a small percentage of the economy, which is the banking system. Well, the fat cats on 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 uh, the bankers have got trillions of dollars there. You know, why are condo prices in New York rebounding? Because their bonus came in. Well, what about the rest of the people? If they really cared, we would have had the 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 we would have had enough um, enough machines to look after everybody through this COVID nineteen. Instead, what is the solution? Well, just put the sheep in the barn and don't let them out, right? And they're staying there, right? Luckily, I live outdoors and I get out and I get my fresh air. Vitamin D is the best thing. Not staying indoors with a mask. The reason why they're doing it is because they don't have any money for us. Well, where did the money go? When do people stop and think? I. Don't. I'm, I'm, I don't care about the masses. I'm just protecting my clients in relation to the big thinking. So again, how fast and how bad is the economic unraveling once it occurs? Is it going to be? I think it's going to be uh, for the for the history books myself, and that's what I'm preparing for. So Jaime, you you t- you post a lot about and and we we've just talked about the the value of the U.S. dollar, let's say, against the other basket of currencies. Do you think that's more important for the value of gold or let's say um, how much consideration do you also put into, let's say, the value of the Canadian or Australian dollar as well? Well, that's a great question because you have to understand that all currencies are pegged to the dollar because this is not the, 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 the Argentinian peso or the Australian dollar or the Canadian dollar heading for devaluation. This is the currency reserve, the one by which all currencies are are pegged to. That's why they're trying to shift it over to the SDR. And by the way, the Chinese haven't said anything as to what's going to be their contribution. The Americans, the Europeans, and the IMF have said what they're going to contribute, uh, but not China. So that is part of the puzzle. However, back to your question, I think the bigger issue is, is that if I'm correct, and this is a currency reserve unwinding, all of the other uh, currencies are going to unwind at a faster pace, which is what happened in the 1770s. That's why the Spaniards didn't say, well, we're going to stay, we're going to stick with the king. They said, forget that. We're going with the Americans. And the Americans said the same thing because the British pound was done. The French sou was done. All of the other currencies devalued thanks to a guy called John Law. Right? A little bit of history will explain that portion, but I think that's what's going to happen this time. Since it's all paper, it's all going to burn up in the same way. So that's why gold and silver are so prescient. And that's why the shift that they're talking about is, is not the, the, the rebuilding of the Titanic. It's a brand new one that's coming down, the, that, that's be sitting beside us. And when do they jump over? And is it going is to work? So in in reality, it might be more instructive to see, let's say, where these currencies actually sit by measuring them against a value or a, a basket of assets and commodities instead, right? Well, the best the best uh, gauge is the McDonald's hamburger one because that's one of the few that we can all gauge globally, right? So, so, but again, if you look at food, you look at the price of food that's going through the roof everywhere. That's that's the 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 inflation hits are are global, right? Uh, again, and you can see it in certain metals. Look at um, uh, look at platinum, look at rhodium, look at iridium, the ones that don't have a futures contracts against them. They're moving. And it's unbelievable how much they're moving. Those, you know, they look just like the inflationary charts of the government of, of, of the money printing. So to me, it's clear they're, they're, the cracks are there. I see them. I've been preparing for them. Uh, most people don't because they're listening to MSNBC that everything's great, everything's hunky dory, and the market's up. And the market's up in US dollars, yes, but just wait until it crashes, right? And that's why I don't care if the market goes to 100,000 points like it did in Venezuela. Uh, what's important is that gold and the market are going to end up at the same level, be it 10,000 and 10,000 or 100,000 or 100,000. Well, gold wins all the time. Right. And that's why they're not selling it. That's why the Chinese keep adding. That's why the Russians, you know, it's funny because if, if we if we look at gold as a percentage of central banks, Canada's out the door, but the Russians are in. They would third to fourth uh, at the table. I think that's one of the reasons why they're pushing the whole Ukraine thing again. Now that Trump is gone because as an energy food basket. Um, and I think it, it it also plays into China's. China's uh, geopolitical would, wouldn't want a strong, a strong Russia. So China to me is the key as to what happens next. But it's pretty clear that a currency reserve shift is happening. They're talking about it. Most people are just figuring out, well, should I own some Bitcoin? Well, if you're at that level, you're still messing with the third and second level of the Titanic. You gotta get out and look at the bigger picture. 
So I may mean, like to like to shift a little bit. You mentioned the silver squeeze. So where do you think it's succeeding? And maybe tell us some things that maybe you think some people are missing or misunderstanding. Well, the one guy that's missing this because he started it was Max Kaiser. I love it how he's full Bitcoin now and he doesn't really look at at, at silver. But I, I, I'm fascinated by the silver squeeze, especially the announcement by uh, Endeavor Silver. Because two key things, and, and one of the reasons why Endeavor and First Majestic have to be have to be signaled signaled out is because management understands that the silver on the ground is not the bullion banks, it's ours, the shareholders. And they're standing up for shareholders by not selling that extra amount. So they're squeezing as well, which is nice to see. It's good to see the producer starting to squeeze. And I think that's one thing that shareholders should seriously consider when they look at their at their companies. Why, especially now that a lot of the producers are making quite a bit of money because they've streamlined themselves. Well, a lot of them, instead of raising dividends or 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 doing share buybacks, I think it's a great strategy to hold withhold production. Because that way, it's also going to squeeze. What I find amazing is that it's a populist thing. It's happening global. The Perth Mint's in trouble. The Royal Mint's in trouble. The Canada Mint. And I think it's hitting them all. And it's a clear reflection as well that that silver is the Achilles heel of the system. Because it's it's, it's in such short supply, but the amount of contracts that they've sold against it is so important. The move from the SLV to the to the PSLV. Actually, it's to, it's it's I, I, I keep ordering. I've been buying silver forever, as you know. And I was hoping that my uh, my silver squeeze batch had come because I ordered some from First Majestic and it's on the truck, it's supposed to be delivered this morning, but it hasn't come. I would have loved to show you when it when it comes, but I'm 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 silver squeezing and helping along as as it goes because that to me is it's it's an amazing populist movement that's come out of Twitter, even though Twitter's been uh, or Reddit, even though Twitter's been uh, been um, censored, but the 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 message getting out and the average little guys getting involved, which is great. And now you're starting to see the producers. More and more producers should be doing that. And, and, and I would encourage my, my holdings and the management of my companies, I will definitely be bringing it up. And it's something that I've talked about in the past. So yes, that is definitely working. So Jaime, what do you think we need to see? What do you think is the most important piece right now that we need to see for gold and silver to start appreciating again? Do we need... Um, real rates to come back? Do we need more inflation scares? Do we need a break in confidence? What do you think we need is, um, is, the, is the most important piece there? Well, again, um, I've always said that until they control the interest rate cycle, because that's how they're producing all of these contracts, the futures contracts, everything, um, we're not going to get anywhere. The, the manipulation will continue. That's why I've always said, buy right, sit tight and wait for it. What breaks first? I don't know. Is it the the that we ran out of silver? Is it that we that that they reset? Um, is it that you know it's so many different variables? All I can tell you is is that they're not going to tell us what they're going to do. All we can do as investors is hedge ourselves, prepare, and asset allocate into positions. That's why again I, I have everybody at thirty percent in 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 some kind of a blend between precious metals and a little bit of blockchain. If not in that other portfolio where it's, where it's all one, but that's a different animal. Uh, 100% is in blockchain and, and precious metals. But um, you got to have those lifeboats. You got to be prepared. And when it goes, it's going to go. It's, it's like trying to time an avalanche. You know that sooner or later it's going to happen. Uh, one thing I I might add there as investors, maybe we need to be watching what the big the big guys are doing that, that when they're trying not to... Um, let's say make waves, they're stacking, the central banks are stacking gold and maybe we need to be more vigilant of, of those actions rather than what they're saying, right? Well, exactly. You got to watch and uh, watch what they do, not what they tell you because they're not going to tell you what they're doing. They're just going to tell you what they want you to do, right? And that's what's amazing. And by the way, you got to think about your savings at the bank, right? You got to think about about how how protected are your investments, Right. So again, it's like, I love the analogy of the Titanic because that's how I've been thinking for a long time because we're going to see a brand new reset occur. The fact that it's they're so loud about a reset and people haven't bothered to understand what does that mean, I find amazing, right? That, that they talk about the SDR. That's why I like James Rickard and, and what he's talking about because he's, and um, uh, Willem Milton Coop as well, which I think you interviewed as well. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the guys that have been on this for a long time. And I would 
try to understand what they're saying so that you can protect yourself as investors. So Jaime, one of the other things that you brought up is the amount of leverage inherent within the system. And and you even mentioned it as um, the amount of short contracts against the amount of silver that's actually available. So do you think that that's going to be play one of the biggest roles in this reset as you see it? Well, that would that could be one of the things that breaks, right? Again, what string breaks first, right? Um, I personally think that the, the the central banks, the bullion banks, have so much control over the system that that um, we have to wait and see how it plays out. However, whichever way it plays out, it's in their benefit to allow gold and silver to rise because that's how they reset. That's how the SDR basket is going to be is going to be restructured, similar to Bretton Woods or similar to, you know, what Nixon had to do. It's always gold around it. So the full structure we don't know, but I can assure you that it's within it, it, that those are going to be the components within it. And so as investors, we have to have some of our money in those real assets. And real assets are moving. Why is gold and silver not moving? Well, because it's being it's being manipulated down, being kept down, and that should that should be all that people understand. But again, you know, since two thousand and eight, everybody's forgotten the amount of leverage that was in place. Now, now we have way more leverage. And if it wasn't for COVID nineteen, think about 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 what would have happened um, after, as the repo market started breaking in twenty nineteen because the Fed was going to supposed to to pull money out. Look at this weekend uh, interview in sixty minutes with with Powell. Where he's saying, "Oh yeah, we're going to let inflation run up a bit." Really, no central bank has ever been able to control inflation once that puppy's out of the uh, that that Pandora's box is open. Well, I guess they will this time. Um, you know, the, the the messages that they're telling us, and 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 uh, and people are, are, and and the financial media is just regurgitating it back as though everything's great. Well, sure, if you want to take that attitude, that's fine. But fool me once in two thousand and eight fooled me twice, it's my fault, right? So no, it's not going to happen that way. And in 2008, the, the other thing is governments bailed out the sector. Who's going to bail out governments? That's why I know it's over. There is no big government to bail out the governments because even the IMF doesn't use their own money. They use theirs. And, and by the way, let's talk about one thing that's so important. There's this whole white privilege thing going on. Well, why don't we talk about all the white people that are managing these central banks, right? I don't see any any racial mix in there. You know, to me, that is the big problem. We're going on about uh, slavery that occurred in the in the 17, 1800s, and yes, the oppression of the of of all of all cultures by by each other. The real oppression to me is what's happening to the monetary system. The fact that our purchasing power continues to lose. All our savings are under their control. You know that should worry people, but I guess the what money is and currency is 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 not part of the narrative. You know they're even changing the way we calculate math so the kids don't see it. I think that's really silly when math is uh, is is, uh, is 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 a language, right? That sure you might try to change some words, but one plus one will always be two. And Einstein would have been up in arms if he was living today in the in what's happening. You know that's the dystopian of the society that we're seeing, and that's where people have to think out of the box. And start to realize, okay, what makes sense here? The dialectic process of asking why, right? I don't think anybody does. There's a guy called JP um, that on YouTube that does a great uh, irony within within it all. I love that guy because he's asking questions, and that's what we need is to start asking questions so that we can start finding solutions without just listening and taking it all in, you know, like puppies. Excellent, Jaime. Do you have anything else to add here as we wrap up? No, I think um, this is going to be a very telling year. Keep your eyes on the dollar. Once it breaks 92, I think it'll accelerate. Um, Keep an eye out on what's happening with interest rates. Again, look at yields. They've gotten up to, on the the 10-year bond, up to 1.72. The dividend yield on the S&P at 1.2. Well, how much how much more can they support the bond market, right? And the stock market at the same time. The stock market goes up, the dividend yield goes down. Well, if the Fed doesn't print money to buy the bonds, yields are going to go up. So you see how the all of those little strings are starting to pop, right? The real question is how long will China allow it to go on because they are who's going to set the next currency reserve. So it's up to them to allow this noise to continue. And let's not forget that they're sitting on 20,000 tons of physical gold that they took from the West through leasing agreements. I've read two articles 
on the leasing agreements by central banks finally. So that light's coming out that a lot of central banks don't have it. At least Canada and Chile were the only two central banks that actually used uh, FASB accounting rules and they did not call a lease an asset. That's why we don't have any gold in Canada or Chile. Interesting. So think for yourself and hedge accordingly. Gold, silver, blockchain. Excellent, Jaime. I think that's a great place to wrap up. we can find you, of course, at IJ Carrasco on Twitter. And also you post very frequently on LinkedIn, uh, just under your name. Jaime, thanks very much for your time today. Thanks for having me again. And always a pleasure to chat with you guys. I'm doing a great job, by the way. I love the, the interview you guys are having. Thank you very much, Jaime. Take care, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.